Hello, welcome to the Cam Johar Show. My guest today is Beverly Mamlabadi. She's a counsellor in Wolverhampton and has a full-time job working in PR. Got a very, very interesting background and story and particularly relatable to um, our main audience of um, the descendants and people from the Punjab. So we're going to talk about that today and lots of other things. So without further ado, welcome Beverly. Thanks, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, good to have you. So tell me, you know, your um, story, where does it start? Uh, we talked a little bit about your father uh, being from Iran. Yeah, so um, my dad is a, a migrant from Iran. He mm -hmm. came here as a young man to study for his degree and um, fell in love with my mum, who's British. Uh, while he was here and actually never went back right. <laughs> so he, he's here to stay um, so he yeah so he my mum and dad are married they live in Manchester where I was born and bred um, and from there I did different things I've worked with young people I've worked with youth offenders I came to the Midlands to study my degree in youth and community services mm -hmm. and ended up in Wolverhampton when I was about 21 managing a youth hostel for homeless young people. Okay, so you've been in that field um, since you were relatively young? Yeah, so um, I suppose helping people and being out in the community is something that's always been on my heart mm -hmm. um, and I've always been involved in those types of jobs that involve young people helping people um and being with the community and making a difference or at least trying to of course but what um, gets um people in these kind of situations um if we're talking about something like homelessness for yeah. example i honestly believe in my experiences of working with homeless young people are that if we are dealt a different hand in life yeah. it could quite easily happen to any of us mm -hmm. so that's why i have never judged anyone who is homeless or who is in a situation where they find themselves to be quite vulnerable because i i do believe that any of us could be dealt a different hand in Absolutely. life um for homelessness the main reason why I found that homeless young people found themselves on the streets or being homeless was mainly down to family breakdown. Mm -hmm. So that could be, you know, I've worked with young people whose parents have died and there hasn't been a family member in that family to take on that young person. Um, so they found themselves homeless. Okay. Um, it could be a relationship breakdown between the parents and the child and they just can't live in the household any longer. Um, but the stereotypical view of homeless people being on the streets because they're on drugs or they take alcohol isn't something that I came across. Um, you know, isn't a reason why young people found themselves to be homeless. So. It, it's maybe not the reasons that you see portrayed in the media or that are the stereotypical reasons and a lot of it is you know not having a network of people around you I'm sure that you know we were talking earlier about having family and friends and I suppose if we found ourselves in a situation where we we didn't have anywhere to live you know touch wood we we would be able to say that someone would take us in and not everyone has that luxury sure sure um, and, and the other thing that you mentioned, alcohol and drugs, and this is why they're there, that's not the cause, is it? That's the symptom. If you are living on the streets, you know, you're going to see a lot more of that. But that's not what causes these kids, yeah. young people, to be on the streets in the first place. Yeah, in my experience, that isn't what causes them. No. And I mean, I've done a few of these charitable sleepouts where... Um, I've done them for the last four years to raise money for the charity, actually, that I used to work for, where... Okay. You're very welcome to come next year, Cam, okay. and join us for a night on the streets to raise I'll some money for I'd charity. I'd be happy to do that. Great, we've got you on camera now, <laughs> so I will hold you to it. But, you know, we go and we spend a night sleeping outside to raise money for charity. And is that cold? Um, I would say if, if I was ever in that situation, I would definitely want to, to drink something to, to warm me up because, you know, your feet, 
when you're sleeping outside can just not get warm. If you think about when you're in bed at night, you almost can't get to sleep, can you, until you've got your feet warm in bed. Um, so yeah, it's, in my experience, definitely not a reason why people become homeless um, at all. But it's, um, it's a great way, isn't it, not to take responsibility, not to take it seriously, for, for, for Joe Public to say, you know what, they're all uh, drunks and they're all alcoholics. We had that recently, didn't we? Um, somebody quite prominent said that about uh, the school meals situation. Uh, yeah. about something to do with that they're all crackheads or something like this yeah i think the comment was that um some of the you know it was a conservative mp that mm. said um some of these free school meal vouchers are being swapped for drugs and That's being right. spent in crackdowns i don't know about you cam but i don't really know any drug dealers that accept tins of beans and <laughs> you know cans of soup as payment for drugs so absolutely not true um there's been you know while we're on the free school meals topic you know, a lot of Conservative MPs have come out and spoke about this dependency culture and that sort of thing. And my my experience of working with people in the community is just absolutely not that. Um, we're in the worst pandemic, the worst recession of our lives. People have lost their jobs. Um, people are struggling to make ends meet. And actually, free school meals are a lifeline for some of these children. Absolutely, and, and it's obvious that that is the case. And, and again, as we, we were talking earlier, there's nobody that wants to have government handouts. There's nobody that wants to be intentionally poor. And you know, God forbid, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a parent myself. Yeah. You know, nobody wants their children to be hungry or to have to look for ha government handouts to feed those children. So to, to and again, going back to, to those unfortunate comments, you know, I hope it was a, a, a slip of the tongue and all the rest of it. But what it does is it absolves people of their responsibility. You know, the thing is that the way we treat our old and the way we treat our poor people is a reflection on all of us, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a few weeks ago during this free school meal um, issue that the country was faced with, I ran a project where um, a team of volunteers, Joe Public, you know, working people, professionals, got in touch with me and said, we, we can't, you know, we, ca we want to do something. Mm. We can't have children in this area going hungry. What can we do? We set up a project. We delivered dozens of free school meals. Sorry, no, we, we delivered dozens of food parcels mm -hmm. to make sure these free school meal children didn't go hungry. And, you know, some of the examples, I came across families who were saying to me, you know, thank you so much for this food parcel because my child normally receives free school meals. But this week, the choice was going to be between letting the gas and electric that's already an emergency run out and not have any heating and whether I can afford to feed my children. So it, it's an absolute lifeline for these families. Um, who, who are so grateful. I think I told you earlier, I had one mum who um, asked for, for a loaf of bread for her children because she had no bread and she said, if you don't mind, get me some butter as well. But if not, don't worry and imagine that choice between actually we've got toast but, but, but we're not going to have any butter on the toast. And these are the real situations that families are faced with. And I think these comments about dependency culture, um, crack dens and swapping free school meal vouchers for drugs and all this sort of stuff. It just shows how out of touch um, some of these conservative MPs are. Every single one of the 300 plus MPs who voted against extending free school meals for children over the summer holidays were conservative. And in addition, in addition to that, the cost to fund free school meals over half term for the country would have cost the same as half a day of what the government spent on the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Well, look, you know, the thing is that it's easy to demonise these people, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, um, and politicians of, of, of all persuasions have used these, these ideas, these thoughts, and said these things sometimes to divide us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing that I'm seeing is that this is an issue that's really brought our country together, hasn't it? Because there's nobody, you know, whether you're a parent or not, wants to see children going hungry. And, you know, it's a, it's a dreadful image of, of our country. You know, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. 
If we can't feed our children, yeah. there's something seriously wrong, isn't there? Yeah, and, and I think what you say about um, the public coming together mm. and standing up in a time when the government hasn't and didn't is really important. And you've seen people of all different faiths and backgrounds uh, the Sikh community in Wolverhampton have been so giving and so kind and um, so determined to make sure that no child goes hungry. There are lots of people from all different backgrounds because, as you say, no matter your you know race, faith, gender, whatever, no one wants to see children go hungry. It's dreadful, dreadful. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't know what's going on internally in politics. And mm. you know, as a councillor, you may know a little bit more, but. There can't be a lot of happy people in the House of Commons, you know, of any any political persuasion that has voted this down. Well, you know, you're seeing across the country people protest in various ways. And in Wolverhampton, the two Conservative MPs who voted against free school meals, um, you know, the public and people who even voted for them had a lot to say about it, were severely disappointed. I think one of the MPs... Um, had his office um, vandalised um, with paper plates that said no child should go hungry. People were really, really devastated for the children of the city and that's happened up and down the country. And I mean, you've got Marcus Rashford, you know, a young footballer having to shame the government, um, the, you know, and people who haven't got a lot of money themselves actually turning up and saying here's a bit for the food bank here's a bit for the food parcels i think it's i think it's shameful i think that the government weren't expecting a bigger back as big as no, backlash as they got and um i think they should stop digging the hills in about this and actually lit listen to the british people who you know as you've said from all kinds of backgrounds are saying mm. This is wrong we need to look after our children yeah what i hope it does because you know one of the things i don't understand is we have um, historically low turnouts for our elections mm. and even more so for local elections and and i hope that you know as you said against certain mps doesn't matter who it is you know they're voted in to represent us sure right and so for them to be held accountable is the only way forward so you know, there's elections very regularly in this country. So look at what your MP is doing. Yeah. You know, how is he or she voting? And if you disagree with that, you know, go and vote for somebody else. And just because your parents voted for a certain party or your family traditionally votes for somebody else, it doesn't matter. You know, if look at the records. I mean, everything's available in terms of what the voting records of particular MPs are. And if you disagree with it and if, if this issue of free school meals for children your mp decided to vote against it and you disagree with that vote for the opposition next time you know they should be held accountable and you know because i think we're too lazy about this thing that people can't be bothered to go and vote yeah i think i think some of it is is not necessarily about being lazy about voting i think it's um having the encouragement, the means um, to be able to go and vote. And I think that um, when I was younger, when I was in school, um, as you've just spoke about, you know, some people vote the way that they do because the parents always yeah. have, you know, how many people know that if you are homeless, you can still be registered to vote. Mm -hmm. You know, you can register to a library, for example, and okay. still use your vote. And that's not something that people know. I was, certainly wasn't taught about that in school myself. Yes. And I think there needs to be more around um, enabling people, and especially people in some of our most vulnerable communities, to use their vote and have a voice. Because um, some of the policies that come out of government are affect some of these communities the most. And... You know, I, I I would really encourage anyone out there to make sure that they are registered to vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I think it's obvious who <laughs> I would tell you how to vote. But, you know, 
register to vote, register for a postal vote. If, you know, there is an elderly person in your community who who can't get out physically to the ballot box, there are postal votes that you can do. So it's just so, so important to use your voice. And I think, I think this year has been quite a politically active year. Very much so. For the country, but internationally as well. And, you know, we, we see, we've, we know what's going on with the pandemic, um, how that's being handled by the government. People have strong feelings about that. Um, what's been happening in America and with with the George George Floyd and what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement, there are lots of people who are becoming very politically aware, who are using their voice in a way that they might not have done before. And I do think that we are become coming more politically active as a as not just a country actually globally. Yeah. But it's so important that people are in, enabled to use their vote as well, you know, and they know how to register to vote. Um, they know where their ballot box is, you know. They know how to get there. They know what time it opens and closes. It's just so, so important. When was the first time you voted, Cam? Um, I voted probably... I don't think I've voted for... 10, 15 years um, after I was, I turned 18. Um, but the thing is that I've always lived in a, a seat um, held by one particular party mm -hmm. um, and a huge majority. So I'm quite a tactical individual. So if, if, I, if there was a chance of something happening in terms of that seat changing hands, then I would go and vote. Um, but as I've gotten older now, it doesn't matter to me whether it's, things are going to change or not. I think it's important that I, I exercise my right to vote because it was, you know, people fought hard mm -hmm. to win those rights. So I think, but I think that that's a journey that most older people take. Mm. But I, I, and you know, and you will bear me out on this because you're a relatively young person and you're in politics, that I think younger people now are far more active you know, and then what's going on globally this year around the world, you know, your vote does matter. Mm -hmm. And and I think that the reason that I probably didn't vote and many people didn't don't vote is because we actually think that, you know, we can't affect change. Yeah. Yeah. I, I speak to young people all the time who um, say some of the same stuff, but actually mm. they, they want change. Of course. Um, and... You know, if I had my way, 16, 17 year olds would be eligible to vote because I work with young people all the time who are so politically knowledgeable, um, who want to see change in their communities. And I think that's becoming a thing, you know, you mentioned the older generation, but actually I think that's becoming younger mm -hmm. and we need people in politics that reflect the communities that they serve and that includes young people as well definitely and you know you mentioned the sacrifices that people made for us to have the freedom to vote and you know especially for women watching this um the suffragette movement in this country there were women that put their lives on the line that died for us to to have the the, the right to vote so I would encourage all the women and especially the young women watching this to watch the suffragette film and see how the women in this country fought for us to have that right so please please use your vote when you know people who've gone before has made those sacrifices it's so important thank you that's a great message so you're a, you're a Labour councillor in Wolverhampton yeah and um, you're a relatively young in terms of uh, uh, what the age of a councillor is, I, I presume. Yeah. And you're the opposite sex of what a, a typical councillor is, I guess, as well. Yeah. Um, so tell me what uh, led you to to um, your interest in politics, mm -hmm. how that came about, and, and how you came to, to, to become a councillor. Yeah, so um, after I worked as, as a manager in a youth hostel working with homeless people, during my time there, I spent some time in the Middle East doing mm -hmm. humanitarian aid work, which had a huge impact 
on my life, to be honest with you. Um, if I can speak to you a little bit about the project that I did over there. Well, you, you went to one of the biggest trouble spots in the world, didn't you? Yeah. Israel and Palestine. Yeah, so okay. I visited Palestine and Israel. And the specific project that I went to do over there is called Keep Hope Alive. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a project where internationals go over as part of a charity and they work on the farms of farmers who are at risk of losing their land for a number of reasons so we go there to pick olives or plant olive trees which might be something you know quite familiar to some of your viewers absolutely <laughs> absolutely i don't think we get many olives in the Punjab. <laughs> yeah but farming yeah. and um you know land is 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 that's what the Punjab is sure. it used to be called the bread basket of india yeah uh, at, at times but let me take you back a little bit so mm -hmm. what is the reason that this is going on because you were telling me about the fact that these palestinian farmers are prevented by law yeah uh, to, to get onto their land etc yeah so um there is um you know palestine and israel is is quite a troubled area Absolutely. of the world and the conflict has been going on since the 40s mm -hmm. um palestine is under occupation and there are there is violence on both sides um the work that i do over there is is particularly trying to help people who are suffering as a result of the political situation um, over there. So um, we go and try and help farmers who are most at risk of losing their land. Why are they at this risk? So there are certain laws that are introduced by the government. Mm -hmm. For example, if you are a Palestinian farmer who hasn't tended to their land for three years, the government can take that land from you, even if you own it. Okay, that's the Israeli government, right? Not yeah. the Palestinians. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the occupied land part. Yeah. Yes. So they can take that land after three years if you've not tended mm -hmm. to your land. And the project that we go over there to do to support is to help those farmers particularly at risk of losing their land so say if their house is here mm -hmm. and their farm is here maybe it used to take them with the tractor and their tools you know five minutes to go over the road to their farm and tend to their land but because of the restrictions that have been put in place by the government there might now be a checkpoint or something in place here in between their house and their farm mm -hmm. which means it now takes them around three hours to get to their farm not only that they might have to pass through a checkpoint it might be a road that they're not allowed to go on and they might be actually turned away so all the all the while their land is not being tended to and there's this risk now with this new law that they could could lose it. So what we do as internationals is we go onto the farms of those farmers who are most at risk of losing their land and we, we tend to the land for them. And you can imagine that what we do as a group of internationals in a day, 50 of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, we pick olives that provides the farmer and his family the opportunity to have you know a better economical situation they can make olive oil they can sell the olives and have you know mm. a wage so although it sounds like something quite small which is you know we pick olives it can be life-changing for some of these families that we go over there to help it's interesting isn't it so there's there's the government not only or the government of israel not only stops these people from earning a living because yeah. they can't get onto the farm yeah and then they um, pass these laws, which means that if they don't tend to their farm for three years, they basically are legally confiscated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there are all sorts of hoops they have to jump through some of these farmers just to get onto their own land and have permits to get onto their own land. Um, so we, we do what we can over there. And there have been times where I've been planting olive trees as well and you know vandals or um whoever have come in the night and ripped up the olive trees that we've planted you know so 
it, it's it's tough out there it's tough anyway because of the political situation mm. but i spent a lot of my time with people whose whole livelihoods and lives are really affected by this on a on a daily basis you know okay but you know you hold down a full-time job yeah um and uh, that's in pr and marketing yeah and so you're a, you're a counselor which takes up your time mm -hmm. and then you do projects like this traveling yeah. to um quite dangerous parts of the world mm -hmm. um what drives you what, why do you do this um i really want to make a difference in the world and i believe that our legacy mm -hmm. when we pass isn't what we have you know how much money we've got it's what real difference have we made in this world mm -hmm. um and i just really care is the truth of course <laughs> um i just really care um about people i think that um we all have different experiences in life, don't we? And we come from different backgrounds. And I think that I have been lucky in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got a roof over my head. I've got food in the cupboards. Um, I've got two jobs. Um, I would say, you know, I I'm really lucky. And I think if I can help people to improve their lives who maybe is not as fortunate, mm -hmm. then maybe that will make a difference in the world, you know? Of course. And I think actually one further that everyone has something to give. I think that people watching this have something to give. I think we all do. I care about fairness and justice. And there will be people at home who care about other things. And what I would say of is course. there are ways to act on that. You know, get in touch with your local councillor, wherever you live. Um, get in touch with charities that are close to your heart, whether it's homelessness or mental health and see how you might be able to become a volunteer. I do think, you know, there are ways that everyone can give and it doesn't necessarily have to be money, you know, sometimes time is more valuable. Of course. One of the things that I really got from when I went to the Middle East was how much seeing what I saw changed my life. Mm -hmm. So when I came back the first time in 2015, I didn't want to just keep going back and doing the project myself. I wanted other young people to experience what I'd experienced so that they also felt so passionate to act when they came back. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, I took 11 young people over to the Middle East to do the same project. In 2018, I took two um, young men over there. And I think um, giving young people this life-changing experience to see how other people in different parts of the world live is is actually invaluable. Oh God, yes. How did um, how did they react when they got out of there? Um, well, to be honest with you, my parents, when I told them I was going to that part of the world for the <laughs> first time, um, you know, I don't think I told my my mum and dad till about a week before. I was just like. You know, don't worry, I'm just heading over to the Middle East <laughs> um, to do some humanitarian aid work. And they were like, what? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had to speak to a few of the parents of these young people to of say, um, you know, this is the project they're going to do. The, these are the risks. Um, these are be the benefits as well, you know. A few of the young people that came a friend of mine will say, oh, you know, my mum still hasn't forgiven you for, for, for <laughs> persuading. But, but, you know, since in the time that I've been there, you know, the programme and the project run very well and it's run very safely. Um, but there are always risks in that side of the sure. world. Um, but the young people, I would say it's life-changing for them, yeah. you know. Um, you automatically think of the Middle East and especially Palestine and Israel as being a very holy um, place yeah, because, there's that element to it, isn't there? Yeah, you know, Bethlehem is there, mm -hmm. Jerusalem is there. These are significant landmarks for um, different religions. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a sense that you'll get over there, and even though you know the situation is quite volatile over there, there will be some sort of holiness when you're in that, you know, that, that part of the world. Um, so I think it's very life-changing for young people yeah. to see that part of the world but also recognize that actually they can do something about it i've since they've come back 
you know, there are young people who went to the Middle East with me and they've been to Parliament and spoke about their experiences in Parliament. They've done presentations to humanitarian groups, to charities, to NGOs. So it's not just about going there, doing something good and coming back, but actually this motivation that these young people now have that they've made a real difference in the world and they're continuing to make a real difference in the world. So it was a real motivation, a real drive for these guys to then go on and do other things after that visit. Yeah, absolutely. And all of them are involved in some sort of charitable work now, whether that be delivering food parcels or, or something. I think, you know, when you've got a heart for this sort of thing, you've just got a heart for it. Mm. And you can't unsee the things that you've seen sure. or unhear the stories that you've heard. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of all of them. Good. You should be. I am. Okay, so one of the things that we discussed um, earlier was the fact that, you know, um, you're a female counsellor mm -hmm. and you're relatively young. Mm -hmm. So what's the typical profile of a, of a counsellor in Wolverhampton? Um, I guess that I'm not sure what the typical profile is. Okay, what do you see? What, what, what do you see in, in I, the council chambers? I think that across the country we can acknowledge that you know there is a higher proportion of men mm -hmm. involved in politics than women. Do you women. have any ideas of percentages? I don't but I know that there's a significant higher amount of men okay. than women in, involved in politics. What I would say is that I'll talk about some of my honest experiences you know mm -hmm. I'm told um, and have been told by male colleagues by male politicians that you know I don't look like a counsellor I don't dress like a counsellor um, and I think that we need to act on this because I've said it before and I'll say it again the people that res represent us in parliament in council chambers need to be reflective of the communities that they 100%, serve absolutely so if we have um not a diverse if we don't have a diverse range of politicians then we don't have a representative i don't want to say choice but we don't have a representative voice yes. for the communities so if you are a young woman and you were thinking or a young man or a young man <laughs> if you're a young woman or a young man and you're thinking actually I really care about making a difference in the world because that's important. Absolutely. You've got to care. And you're thinking, you know, maybe it's not for me. Actually, it is. There are people in your community who need your voice, other young people who need the voices of young people to fight for their rights and that sort of thing, you know. Who can be the voice of young people in Parliament or in the Council if we don't have them as politicians? Well, we're, we're, we're living in a democracy, right? So exactly. anybody can get become a councillor. Anybody can't become an MP. Yeah, so there's no qualifications. I would say there are particular skills and attributes. You've got to care about people. You've got to care about making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be passionate. Um, and I would say, you know, you've got to have some real life experiences as well. Um, it's not all it's not about qualifications um i think that there are two elements of being a politician one is about policy and shaping policy that affects a city or if you're in government the country but the part of the job that's that's really important is about people mm -hmm. you know you've got to be able to talk to people you've got to be able to understand people you've got to be able to show empathy so if that sounds like you, then if you Google how to become a counsellor in your area, it will bring you up the information that you need. Brilliant. That's great advice. So if any of you, any of you are interested, you now know what, you, what to do. But we want to, you know, one of the biggest issues that I see is, is to do with representation mm -hmm. in terms of, I don't think our parliament represents the public any longer. I think there's mm. massive uh, disjointing going on. Why do you think we continue to elect basically Eton-type educated men to Parliament 
when the vast majority of us don't go to fee paying schools, the vast majority of us are everyday people. Are those people not coming forward? Or are we still sort of, is there, is there an element of respect? Is there an element of, you know, uh, fear of the mm. fact that these ruling classes as they are, uh, are the ones that can continue to lead us? It's hard for me to get into the psychology of, or even the minds of people that vote, um, you know, the Eton boys in, yeah. because I don't vote for them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard for me to, um, you know, get into the psychology of that. Well, what's your view on it? Why do you think it happens? I think they're completely out of touch. So I, I don't know. I, I don't. We vote them in. I guess so. Don't we? We're yeah. a democracy. Yeah. So we vote these people in, and so there's been some headlines and, and some quite ridiculous headlines, but we're poking fun uh, as to who should lead our country and what type of people they should be. You know, apparently Basil Brush is going to stand. <laughs> right. But you know, but it highlights the issue, doesn't it? Yeah. You know that somebody like Marcus Rashford, they can mm -hmm. give him a, give him an, an MBE. But I understand that nobody from the government's actually even bothered to meet him. Yeah. So what I would say is, this is something that bothers me because mm -hmm. our side of the house is much more representative of the country than the governing party. Okay. You know, we have more women. Mm -hmm. We have more ethnic minority groups mm -hmm. who represent our party. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we are more representative. Of course we can always do better. I can't pinpoint why the Eton boys are so popular or get voted in. But what I would say is that if it bothers you or it bothers you at home, put yourself forward. As I keep saying, people need representatives of their community that reflect who they are that have had their experiences i'm sure none of these um politicians who've been to fee paying schools to eton and all the rest of it have received a few free school meal before <laughs> so how would they understand the country's feeling they couldn't possibly could they exactly but tell me something so you know, the Labour Party we're talking about, and you say that they represent, you know, they're more representative of the country mm. as a whole. Ethnic minorities, females, they're more like the general public than the Conservative Party is, and, you know. So why do you think, you know, that these so-called Eton boys have an 80-seat majority? Yeah, um, there's no shying away from this. You mm. know, we had the worst election result in December. Mm definitely in my time at yeah alive. and i'm not we're not i'm not trying to do politics yeah. i'm just you know we're taking this this debate or discussion forward sure in terms of why are we as the public doing this and why did we why do we you know uh vote in in record numbers for the tory party when they don't represent or they don't appear to represent us yeah absolutely and i think that what i will say on this is that for well, since April, the Labour Party is under new management and the handling of the pandemic has shown that, for me, Keir Starmer would be absolutely, you know, much better in leading the country than Boris Johnson. Um, we are moving to, the parties moved to a different place since the new leadership mm -hmm. in April. And I think, you know, even you come, you can see the change in the party since April. So I think there were some issues in the December election. I think one was the Labour Party leadership at the time. I don't think um, many working class families um, felt that they could vote for the leadership at the time. Why do you think that was? Um, because I, from, from, I mean, as I said, we're not here to knock anybody or pick sides or anything like that. So, you know, the, the previous leadership, Jeremy Corbyn, mm -hmm. would appear to represent, you know, very working class type people. I think there were 
policy areas and other areas of the leadership in December that working class people didn't feel they could align to. I think mm -hmm. that um, at that time there were issues um, that were left unaddressed, you know, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party being one of them. Well, that's been the hot potato, hasn't it? Absolutely. In, in, in the party for how many years now? It's just haunted the party, you know, for years and years and years, hasn't it? Absolutely. And I think that, again, you know, what I will say is that what, what we've seen over the last month is that the Labour Party is under new management on this issue as well. You know, um, the damning EHRC report on anti-Semitism anti was a very shameful time for the Labour Party. Mm. And under Keir's leadership, he's taken action. And the party, you know, it's time to rebuild with the Jewish community and get to a place, hopefully, where the Jewish community feels safe within the Labour Party. Um, so so I, I do believe this was an issue. Um, the thing with the, the EHRC report, what was so devastating is that the EHRC was created by our party. Yes. <laughs> by, by our party. And that very body has found us guilty mm -hmm. of, of not acting on uh, anti-Semitism, which, which for me is, is devastating. The Labour Party obviously has been, been the party that um, a lot of minorities, and especially the Asian Party, mm. have historically voted for. And, uh, you know, this week I read that one of the, the union leaders, Len McCluskey, I believe, said that obviously Jeremy's been um, suspended from the party and said that if he's not reinstated, there could be a split in the party. And the, 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 the headline that I read, which was quite laughable, really, was that he said that you know, we would not do very well at the polls uh, in the next general election if um, Corbyn wasn't reinstated. I don't see how the Labour Party could have done any worse than no. that was under his leadership. No, so I... where are you on that? I think that um, in Keir's response to the EHRC report, he hit the nail on the head when he said, if you are in the Labour Party and you you know, want to sort of say this report is a load of rubbish or you don't want to acknowledge the pain that the Jewish community have been put through, um, then you're part of the problem. Yes. And I think that sums it up. And I think he also said, and you don't belong in this party mm. because we are the party, you know, of anti-racist yes we are the party that doesn't divide and we've been shameful on this so we're under new management um and if you don't see a problem you're part of the problem yeah and it's um it's a very business-like response isn't it you know that's how a ceo of a company would respond and i really like that because i, I don't really lean one way or the other mm -hmm. in, in, in my politics so, you know, I, I go with the side that's right in, in my mind. And so when I see good, it doesn't matter who's saying it, yeah. you know, and, and I, what I see is fantastic management yeah. um, since uh, Keir Starmer took over. And soon as that election process began, you know, um, I kind of said, that's the that's only one person that you can elect. And yeah. that was him. And, and, you know, don't be fooled because Kia had support from all sides of the party. Of course. And that's really important because I think Kia understands different types of people. And Kia, as you've said, you know, is the right person um, for this. He's been great during the pandemic. He's been strong. He's challenged and held the government to account when they've needed it. Um, and I think we're going to see more of this. I think Good. I really think we are. Good. So look, you know, time waits for no man is a phrase that I often use. And these things just go so quickly. Um, so in closing, you know, you're, you're an amazing role model. Thank you. 
and I think you know there's a lot to learn from 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 the young people that watch this mm -hmm. whether they be young men or young women doesn't mm -hmm. matter you know the thing is that so your message is get involved in local politics yeah yeah get involved in the issues that matter to you because you know it's very easy now to have a voice yep through social media absolutely and if they have an interest in politics would you join a political party um yeah i would i would say mm -hmm. um if there are issues that you care about and you feel motivated for change you can look up all the political parties in this country you can read their manifesto you can read um, their values on different issues and you can join a party that aligns to your values but you can also stand as an independent as well okay so that's an option for people um if they you know were didn't felt aligned to any political party they could and there are other great organizations that are political parties but enable you to make a difference there's a great charity called hope not hate which is mm -hmm. all about um fighting hatred and divisiveness in this country uh, wonderful charity doing great work um, they were a charity who um, uncovered a plot to murder an MP by a far-right group uh -huh. um, but they do fantastic work in challenging discrimination so even if it's not a political party but you want to make change there are some great organizations out there and then if they're really stuck you can get in touch with me and I can point you the right way <laughs> <laughs> bit of a plug there <laughs> yeah, that's lovely listen it's been wonderful and it's been an education for me. There's lots of things that we've touched on today and I'd like to go much deeper. Homelessness is, is an yeah. issue that's very dear to my heart. I've been in property and property related businesses all my life. And you know, property has been very kind to me. And I've done some work with, with our local council in, in terms of tackling homelessness. And, and again, you know, I was born in India. Mm. So I kind of have an appreciation of, of this country and, and the position that we're in and I've traveled all over the world and I can't understand again the fifth largest economy in the world why we have homelessness I just don't it should not exist no. and you know in in where we are today you know it's 2020 we're coming to the end of 2020 and we're still talking about this problem in a country like this yeah it's unbelievable to me that what it says to me is that we just haven't got the political will to actually tackle it and, and, and get rid of it for good. So, you know, the, there are huge issues and, and especially, you know, our young people who are our future. You know, to see them homeless is, is so sad and such a wasted opportunity. Yeah. Do you think that one of the, the biggest problems in, in government is that we have kind of sticky plaster solutions to problems? Because if a percentage of our population, for instance, women are discriminated against, mm. so we hold them back. So which means they can't do the jobs that they're qualified to do. They can't contribute to the economy. So if we've got young people that are homeless that could contribute, you know, if we invested just a little bit in those people, whether it's time and money, that one day that they could actually, you know, make us all richer by the contribution that they could make. As I've said throughout, I believe that everyone has something to give and, you know, I've met young people who've lived in my hostels mm. who were homeless. They've gone on to university, uh, they work, they took one of them to the Middle East with me right. to do humanitarian aid work. Every single young person I have come into interaction with in that hostel has something to offer. They might not make the country rich, as you say, but they have something to contribute to society, 100%. So yes, I do believe that there are future, there are issues, you know. It's not necessarily about putting a roof over people's head to solve homelessness. It's about getting to the root causes of homelessness so that it doesn't occur. Mm. There's a project that I've been involved with, um, the same charity, um, called Supported Lodgings, where homeless young people go and live in the spare room of families. Yes. I've had young women live with me who have fleed arranged marriages and they've needed to escape their situation. And actually, giving someone a roof over the head is okay, but 
giving them a bed in your home and love and care wow. is transformational for people's lives. So I do believe that everyone has something to give and contribute to society. What a great way to look at life and things. Yeah. So really appreciate the time. Come back and we'll talk about some things that we've talked about today that we've touched upon. So guys, that's it for, for today. Um, an incredible story and, you know, one, uh, I guess that we've, we've not had uh, a younger person, we've not had somebody that's involved in politics. So if you're passionate about politics, about what happens to this country and what happens to the world, get involved. You know, there's never been a better time. And, you know, we've got time on our hands with what, what is happening in the, in the wider world right now. Reach out to people, reach out to people like Beverly. They're here to help you and not to hinder you and take action because you can affect change and you can make your own life and those of your communities much better than it is today. And you can contribute and do something about those things that you're not happy about. So that's it for today. We'll see you again on the Cam Joe Show. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.